dengan kondisi yang tidak kita ketahui historinya maka akan masuk. Halo. Tiga tahun dari kelas satu sampai kelas tiga. Hah? Hah, sudah mulai. Kenapa bisa? Ya gitu lah bukannya. Ya, sudah bisa masuk? Masuk. Oke. Dina, oke. Pak Ya. Dokter Benyamin belum masuk ya? Iya. Kita ada ruangan khusus. Sebentar oh. saya hubungi dokter Hidayat dulu okay. ya. Dokter Ben sudah masuk tuh. Oh ya, oke, okay, oke. Okay. Hai, dokter Ben. Oke, okay, hai, hai. Halo. Uh, hai, sorry ya. Dia, 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 uh, dia solving some technical issues. Ah, uh, no worries. Just a moment, oke, okay, dokter Ben. Um, oke, okay, Dr. Ben, can I introduce you to uh, Prof. Dina? Uh, Prof. Dina okay. is uh, our director for national collaboration in University of uh, North Sumatra. Okay. Uh, she's the main uh, organizer for this. Uh, she's been very good partner of us. Okay. We've been, been, been uh, liaising with her for a very long time already. Hello. Hi, Dr. Ben. Hi, hello, hello, hi. Uh, welcome to our uh, virtual seminar ah, yes, today, yes. and we are yep. very grateful that you are here today. Join with us and with all of the Universitas Sumatera Utara Faculty of Medicine uh, yeah. student. And thank you, Dr. Wayan, eh, Bapak Wayan. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And actually, we have to meet in one one room. I will ask Dr. Hidayat to collect, uh, to invite us in one room. And uh, here we are. Uh, we are now with Dr. Andika also as a moderator. Dr. Andika, please. Yeah. Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. I've already been here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben. Thank you, Pak Wayan, for coming here in this webinar. Yes. All right, Dr. Andika. Okay. This the moment, Dr. Ben and Bapak Wayan. Uh, is there anything you want to brief uh, Dr. Ben first before we start? Yes, yes, yes. But just a moment. I will ask Dr. Hidayat first to invite us in one room. Just a moment, please. I see. Okay. Mm.
Sembilan hari. Adik-adik sekalian, selamat datang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ben Ben Benjamin Cheng uh, juga ada di sini Bapak Wayan dari Singapura. Nanti akan diperkenalkan uh, oleh Dokter selaku moderator yaitu Dokter Andika Pradana. Jadi adik-adik masih ada waktu kita sekitar 4 menit lagi. Saya harapkan langsung dipanggil teman-temannya, diajak bergabung dengan teman-teman yang lain. Jangan lupa kalau bisa sebenarnya tulis nomor stambu, nomor apanya. Jadi saya bisa lebih jelas uh, ke ikut sertaan kita. Nanti akan saya berikan juga uh, absensinya ya lewat chat. Uh, demikian ya adik-adik ya, kita tunggu pukul 10 ya. sudah baca saya sudah baca tapi saya sebelum masuk ke substansi satu persatu Hai Prof Aldi saya selamat pagi Pak Wayan apa kabar baik Prof Aldi Prof can I introduce you to Dr Ben uh, uh, yes yeah, sure. uh, Dr Ben this is a Prof Aldi Prof Aldi is the dean of a medical faculty of USU Uh, uh, morning, Dr. Ben. Good morning, Prof. Morning. Hi. It's nice to meet you. It's, it's an honor for us to have you giving lecture. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank, thank you me. very much. Thank you, Pak Wayan. Thank you, Pak Dr. Ben. Prof. Siap, Pak Wayan. Baik-baik saja, Prof. 
Gak lama kita gak ketemu ya, Pak ya. Iya, Prof. Baik-baik saja. Ya, baik-baik. Medannya gak baik, Pak ya. <laughs> Medannya uh... merah membara, ya, Pak ya. Iya, saya dengar begitu ya. Cuman ya, ya kita pelan-pelan lah, Prof. Ya mungkin uh, sedikit-sedikit apa yang mesti perbaiki, uh, apa yang mesti dijalankan, dijalankan. Iya, mudah-mudahan, Pak. Iya. Prof Aldi, mungkin sudah ya. bergabung di sini. Apakah eh, nanti sekalian kok enggak, Prof Aldi, biar sekalian membuka aja bagaimana, Pak? Atau gimana? Kita jam sepuluh, insya Allah cepat nanti. Ya, terserah Prof Dina. Saya oh. sambil <laughs> saya pakai dua laptop, Pak. Ya. Minta tolong Prof Dina tadi awalnya, karena sedang ada rapat senat akademik. Iya, iya. Okay, Dari pukul okay, 9 lagi. tadi saya mengikuti rapat senat. Oh. Cuma udah disetujui pembukaan SP2 penyakit dalam kita, nah. Oh. Jadi udah. <laughs> Jadi, udah, udah, udah bisa udah bisa meninggalkan oh, okay. beralih sedikit perhatian. Tadi saya harus mengawal itu, Pak. Oh iya iya. iya. Kita kita ajukan pembukaan program studi baru. Jadi oh, begitu disetujui kan oh, itu harus saya kawal. Makanya saya minta Prof Dina yang buka dulu. Oh, Karena harus saya kawal ya, jangan sampai ini udah disetujui yang usulan dari FK sudah disetujui oleh Senat Akademik. Congratulations. Jadi, ya, sudah sudah bisa perhatiannya pindah sebentar. <laughs> saya juga sudah minta Masih izin rapat, Prof, sih, tadi. tadi jam 11 saya akan kabur sebentar karena juga saya akan ada meeting lainnya lagi ya, nah. saya juga habis pembukaan ini saya masih melanjutkan rapat senatnya Pak ya. masih ada ya, tiga, tiga agenda lagi ya Prof udah apa udah kangen ke Melbourne Pak Wayan <laughs> Melbourne, iya, oh, ya. ya, Prof. Kapan datang lagi? Kita mau ke Melbourne gak lagi. Bisa, kan nggak bisa. Kalau bisa kami belum udah boleh. datang. Iya, belum boleh ya, masih belum buka. Belum kita boleh. Juga. Kalau masuk Singapura kena isolasi kami dua minggu. Dua minggu pulang pulang. Ya, prof datang kemari, uh, rencananya satu bulan, Prof. Dua minggu isolasi, dua minggu lagi kita ke Melbourne. Iya. Tapi saya tetap kontak dokter Elaine kok. Ya, Prof. Bagus ya. Bagi email ya. Uh, Prof. Dina, bahasa Inggris harusnya nggak ada masalah ya, teman-teman mahasiswa ya? Ya, nggak ada masalah, Pak. Insya Allah nggak ada masalah. Mereka juga kadang-kadang uh, diajari juga pakai presentasi eh, mulai, mulai. bahasa Inggris. Ini campur antara mahasiswa sarjana kedokteran, jadi yang undergraduate, kemudian yang pendidikan profesi, Pak, yang dokter, yang koas, dan yang sedang spesialis. Ya. Uh, uh, Dr. Ben, uh, they, 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 uh, I don't think English will be the problem. Um, they, they, are, they are quite good. Okay. All right. Uh, our students can understand you. Uh, okay. That's great. That's great. Well, I think. Okay. Uh, mungkin buat yang peserta tolong di mute dulu semua mikrofonnya atau host bisa di mute dulu biar nanti kalau Dr. Ben bicara tidak ada suara yang masuk mengganggunya dari hostnya. Baik, terima kasih Prof. Uh, mohon izin kepada seluruh partisipan yang hadir dalam uh, Zoom meeting kita kali ini. Kami mohonkan dengan sangat hormat untuk memute terlebih dahulu mikrofonnya agar proses pelaksanaan webinar dapat berjalan dengan lancar. Uh, sekali lagi kami informasikan kepada seluruh hadirin yang baru bergabung mungkin agar memute uh, mikrofonnya supaya suaranya dapat terdengar dengan baik dan kita dapat mengikuti webinar ini dengan lancar. Oh iya. Kalau di jawab boleh terus. Cuma kemarin kebetulan kan tenamer pas kebetulan kemarin kelas ada. Tekanan Dika mungkin host aja yang memiut semua kan dari host bisa dimiut semua. Ya sebentar Prof, saya sedang miut.
Baik. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, selamat pagi dan salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Good morning to each and every single one of us. Uh, pertama-tama marilah kita panjatkan puji dan syukur kehadiran Allah Subhanahu wa taala yang telah memberikan nikmat kepada kita semua nikmat kesehatan yang begitu besar bagi kita semua sehingga di masa pandemi Covid-19 ini kita masih diberikan kesehatan dan dapat beraktivitas seperti biasa di masa adaptasi kebiasaan baru ini. Uh, uh, pertama-tama saya ucapkan selamat datang kepada seluruh hadirin yang telah berpartisipasi dalam acara webinar Zoom meeting kita pada hari ini yang saya hormati Bapak Dekan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara Bapak Profesor Dr. Aldi Rambe spesialis saraf konsultan yang saya hormati juga uh, pada Wakil Dekan 3 Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara Profesor Dr. Dina Kemalasari spesialis gizi klinik kemudian yang saya hormati adalah Bapak perwakilan dari uh, Singapura Sing Health adalah uh, maaf oh, sorry. Izin, uh, mohon izin suara saya terdengar. Terdengar, Dika. Ah, ya, baik. Terima kasih, Mohon izin, Prof. Tadi ada uh, masalah. Tidak perlu apa-apa, kan? Buku kok, Pak? Bahwa itu... Baik, mohon izin, mohon izin, mohon maaf tadi ada sedikit masalah gangguan pada audio. Uh, selamat datang juga kami ucapkan kepada uh, pembicara kita pada hari ini yang telah bergabung bersama kita, yaitu Dr. Benjamin Cheng. Uh, welcome, Dr. Benjamin, to our webinar today. We are very pleased to have you to join us in our webinar. Uh, we are really looking forward to have some information from you about the updates in Singapore, lessons learned from Singapore that can be applied in Indonesia. Hopefully that this can be a very good information for us to apply in Indonesia, Dr. Ben. Uh, baik, pertama-tama uh, kita akan mendengarkan terlebih dahulu kata sambutan dari Bapak Dekan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara. Sebelum kita memulai webinar kita pada hari ini, kami mohon izin kepada Bapak Profesor Dr. Aldi Rambi, Spesialis Saraf Konsultan, kami persilakan waktu dan tempat. Silakan, Prof. Terima kasih, Dr. Andika. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Pertama-tama mari kita panjatkan puji dan syukur kehadirat Allah yang Maha Kuasa karena pagi ini kita masih memperoleh nikmat sehat untuk mengikuti acara webinar yang diadakan oleh Fakultas Kedokteran Usu bekerjasama dengan Sing Health. Uh, yang saya hormati Profesor Dina Kemalasari, uh, Dr. Andika, to our distinguished speaker Dr. Ben- Benjamin Cheng, and Mr. Wayan Sai from Sing Health. Uh, on behalf of Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara, we would like to express our gratitude uh, that you can join us here to give a lecture about uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Singapore. As we know, for the last five, to, uh, five months, we are in a very difficult situation in Singapore also, as well as in Medan. And we have to learn more about this uh, disease from you, from Singapore, because we still have uh, problems with uh, COVID-19 management in Indonesia, especially in Medan. So we do thank you to join us here in our guest lecture program uh, and sharing the information to us about how Singaporeans deal with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, terima kasih juga saya sampaikan kepada para seluruh seluruh para peserta yang mengikuti acara ini, baik mahasiswa pendidikan sarjana kedokteran, program profesi dokter dan para PPD serta para dosen ada juga saya lihat beberapa yang hadir. Mohon kita ikuti acara ini dari awal sampai akhir dengan sebaik-baiknya. Tanyakan yang kurang jelas agar kita mendapat manfaat yang sebesar besarnya dari acara yang digagas ini. Terima kasih juga kepada Prof. Dina yang telah mengarrange acara ini dengan baik. Semoga acara ini bermanfaat bagi kita semua. Uh, dengan mengucapkan Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, saya buka acara guest lecture kerjasama Fakultas Kedokteran Usul dengan Singhal pagi ini. Uh, once again, we would like to express our uh, uh, gratitude to Dr. Benjamin Cheng and Mr. Ryan Sai from Singapore. And we do hope uh, our cooperation can be uh, 
continue in the future. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Dekan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara, Profesor Aldi Rambi, spesialis saraf konsultan yang telah menyampaikan opening speech untuk memulai webinar kita pada hari ini. Kami ucapkan selamat datang sekali lagi kepada hadirin. Senang sekali pada hari ini kita sudah bergabung sebanyak lebih kurang 355 partisipan yang bergabung dari seluruh mahasiswa, baik dari S1 Pendidikan Dokter, kemudian... Ya. Ya. Uh, senang sekali sudah bergabung bersama kita lebih kurang 360 partisipan wow. baik mahasiswa dari pendidikan dokter S1 kemudian dari Andika dokter Andika ya. ya Prof ya dan juga dari peserta program pendidikan dokter spesialis uh, dan saat ini masih terus bergabung lagi peserta-peserta lain mudah-mudahan jumlahnya akan semakin banyak supaya semakin banyak lagi yang bisa mendapatkan informasi dan ilmu yang bermanfaat dari webinar kali ini baik sebelum saya memulai acara webinar kali ini saya akan terlebih dahulu membacakan uh, memperkenalkan pembicara kita pada hari ini first like I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, we have already invited Dr. Benjamin Chen. He is a uh, program director in infectious disease from Singapore. Uh, once again, welcome, Dr. Benjamin. And the, uh, Dr. Benjamin will give a plenary lecture for us about strategy in managing and mitigating COVID-19 infection. We are going to learn from Singapore the experience, their real-time, real-life uh, uh, activity in COVID-19 in Singapore. So for information, our webinar today is live stream on YouTube. So everyone who cannot join this webinar Zoom meeting can also uh, watch in YouTube from live streaming so that we can hope that our information can be spread for many, many students and then we can get the very valuable information from webinar today. Okay, baik. Uh, kita akan segera memulai sesi webinar Zoom meeting kita pada hari ini. Uh, kurang lebih webinar Zoom meeting kita untuk presentasi dari Dr. Benjamin Che akan berlangsung selama kurang lebih 30 menit. Dan selanjutnya kita akan mengadakan sesi Q&A, question and answer, kepada peserta webinar yang ingin bertanya, dapat langsung bertanya melalui uh, via chat di aplikasi Zoom ini, kemudian nanti kita akan diutarakan di pada saat sesi question and answer agar dapat menghemat waktu dan mengefisienkan acara. Baik. Uh, kita akan langsung memasuki sesi puncak webinar kali ini. Uh, uh, Dr. Ben, uh, we are going to, we are looking forward to have uh, information from you, your presentation about uh, strategy and managing in mitigating COVID-19 infection from Singapore. So we are going to, I, I would like to inform to all the participants to mute the first, uh, your audio. So Dr. Ben, please, time is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. And uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, having me here. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Oh, I love your English. So, wow, I like English. Wait. Wait. Okay, I hope uh, you can see my screen right now. Yes, okay, we can already see the screen. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Ben. So, um... Uh, so thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Dr. Benjamin from the Department of Infectious Disease in Singapore General Hospital. And uh, I thought that uh, actually this, I would uh, modify the title of talk a little bit. Um, and it is still going to be talking about how to mitigate the impact of uh, COVID-19. But the perspective is coming from uh, my perspective, which is actually a, a essentially a doctor who's working in, in Singapore General Hospital and uh, in the Department of Infectious Diseases. So before we uh, go into that, uh, perhaps let's just summarize uh, what uh, some of the important points that we know so far about uh, COVID-19. So the agent or the infectious agent is uh, SARS, coronavirus 2, and the main transmission is uh, via droplet 
as well as through close contact. Uh, there have been concerns as well as reports indicating the possibility of airborne transmission as well as transmission via fomites, but uh, the majority of transmission still happens mainly via droplet and contact. And the incubation period is an average of five to six days, uh, although it can stretch up to even two weeks. And uh, even longer incubation periods have been reported, but that those cases are uncommon. <laughs> What is also known about this condition is that pre-symptomatic transmission is possible, meaning that uh, people who are infected are able to transmit COVID-19 to other people even before they, they themselves develop uh, symptoms of COVID-19. And it's estimated that the duration of pre-symptomatic transmission uh, is between two to three days. Uh, it is also widely known that asymptomatic transmission occurs. So people who are infected with COVID-19 but do not exhibit symptoms are equally infectious. We also know that uh, fortunately, the majority of people who contract COVID-19 develop uh, asymptomatic or mild illness. So that is about uh, 80%. Unfortunately, 20% do develop moderate to severe illness. They may develop pneumonia, they may require oxygen. And out of the 20%, 5% will require some form of ICU care, really requiring intubation and, vent and mechanical ventilation. And to date, uh, when I checked the WHO website uh, last night, there were already more than 21 million confirmed cases in the world and over 770,000 deaths uh, globally. And these numbers, as you know, continue to rise uh, day by day. So perhaps uh, to be a bit more clear about uh, my perspective, uh, I need to tell you a bit about, a little bit more about myself. So I actually am from Malaysia and I came over to Singapore to study uh, medicine in the National U University of Singapore in year 2000. And I graduated in 2005 and I uh, started my housemanship on my training years in Singapore General Hospital. And then in 2012 onwards, I started my advanced specialist training in infectious disease and I graduated in 2015 as a specialist in infectious diseases. And this is where I'm practicing right now. So what does this tell you? It tells, it tells all of us that during the initial, the first SARS outbreak in 2003, I was only a third year medical student. And uh, I remember in the SARS outbreak in 2003, uh, medical students were not allowed into clinical areas. And so that uh, resulted in a very prolonged vacation for me. So actually this experience of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is actually a new experience for me as it is for you now. Of course, uh, I was already practicing medicine uh, when there was the H1N1 pandemic, but this COVID-19 pandemic is uh, totally different uh, uh, experience as compared to uh, H1N1. Okay, so let's go into the talk uh, proper. So when we talk about mitigating the impact of uh, COVID-19, what does this mean from a hospital's perspective or Singapore General Hospital's perspective? So our aims of uh, mitigating the impact is that number one, we knew that we needed to uh, detect the cases early. And the purpose is so that these cases can be isolated as soon as possible and contact tracing uh, can happen as soon as possible as well. And all this uh, serves a few aims. Number one, to prevent nosocomial transmission. So patients who uh, come in or are admitted into the hospital, if we are able to uh, know which ones are the ones who should be isolated uh, and, and, uh, and uh, tested for COVID-19, uh, therefore, then if we are able to ring fence these uh, infected people, then we will be able to prevent no so common transmission. That means patient to patient transmission of COVID-19 within the hospital. So that was our primary aim. Other aims were also uh, to prevent the transmission to healthcare workers. So those patients who are isolated are then uh, cared for by healthcare workers on full uh, personal protective uh, equipment and therefore the purpose is to prevent uh, transmission of uh, infected patients uh, uh, to healthcare workers and subsequently from uh, among healthcare workers as well. And then moving along, uh, we also, uh, our other aim 
to mitigate the impact was to make sure that we are able to provide the most appropriate treatment uh, for patients who are subsequently diagnosed to have COVID-19. And the appropriate treatment needs to be based on the best currently available evidence-based medicine that was uh, uh, around at that time. And of course, what is also even also um, equally important is that we, need, we knew that we needed to minimize the impact on non-COVID-19 healthcare services. Because um, other things still happen, patients with uh, cancer still come in with their problems. Patients uh, who also come in with surgical emergencies and all these patients also equally need to be uh, cared for. And we wanted to make sure that all these uh, uh, services uh, ran as smoothly as possible. So actually it helped that uh, we in Singapore as well as the other uh, um, countries uh, in the world had some forewarning. Um, in the, so this is a timeline that describes the, the, um, how this uh, COVID-19 first started. On the 8th of uh, December in 2019, there was the first case that was reported. And by the end of December, there was already known to be a cluster of uh, cases of pneumonia of unknown uh, etiology, uh, all clustered in Wuhan. And most of the cases were linked to uh, the seafood market, the Huanan seafood market. Right? And most of the cases were actually the vendors who were uh, working in the seafood market. And a week later, uh, it was already identified to be a novel uh, coronavirus that was uh, preliminary named as the 2019 novel coronavirus, which was then eventually named as SARS-CoV-2. Then about five days later, and in the next, in the, in the following uh, two to three weeks, actually the other countries uh, started reporting their own uh, first imported cases. So Thailand, Japan, South Korea, and all the way up to the uh, US. So in this, during this period, uh, in the early period of January, we already knew that we had to start our preparations because it was only a matter of time that uh, an imported case would come. So um, the preparations that were done were mainly the formation of a task force or a command center. Uh, in our hospital, it's called the EPR or the Emergency Preparedness and Response. This uh, uh, kind of structure was already actually in place uh, even before this because you know, we had uh, the hospital had experience in dealing with SARS. Uh, it dealt with H1N1, and also when there were also uh, outbreaks globally, for example, the Ebola outbreak and all that, uh, all these um, uh, new made us uh, uh, on of this, and we knew that we needed to have uh, some sort of a task force that we would uh, be able to quickly uh, put up as and when is needed. So the command center for the task force is the major uh, uh, a group of uh, people that would then uh, coordinate the fight uh, against uh, uh, pandemics, uh, or against infectious diseases, right? And in this case, it was uh, uh, formed to uh, fight uh, COVID-19. So as of any uh, infectious disease, um, isolation uh, ward uh, became a very important uh, place. So our isolation ward uh, had to be prepared and we needed to step up the training of uh, both the nurses as well as the doctors. So in SGH, uh, there we do have uh, a one main isolation ward, it's called Ward 68, uh, where it is consists of mainly um, uh, single rooms, negative pressure with uh, anti, anti rooms, um, as well as positive pressure rooms as well. And besides that, we knew that we also had to start stockpiling uh, personal protective equipment and also another part of uh, the preparation that was very, very important is to get a validated molecular test ready so that we had to be ready with these diagnostic, diagnostic tests as soon as a case presents to us. And also uh, the last point is to create the case definition of suspect cases. What is the definition that we will use uh, to define a suspect case? Because these case definitions then need to be um, forwarded to the frontline people especially, for example, physicians who work in the emergency department, uh, because we knew that those, uh, these are the front lines that would uh, most likely uh, encounter the first case of uh, COVID-19. So this is the first case of uh, COVID that we had uh, in, in uh, oh, sorry, this is the first, uh, sorry, uh, suspect definition, first case suspect definition uh, that uh, was, uh, that came up with 
and this is uh, was used uh, nationally, so used throughout uh, Singapore. So during the early days of outbreak, uh, where all the cases were all linked to Wuhan, so therefore the, the link to Wuhan was the main uh, epidemiological criteria. And we decided that uh, those uh, people who come in with uh, evidence of lower respiratory tract infection linked by pneumonia or having some severe respiratory tract infection as evidenced by breathlessness or uh, tachypnea or saturation, uh, oxygen saturation below 94% uh, on room air together with a uh, history of travel or, or, or residence in Wuhan in the last 14 months this would fulfill the criteria for suspect case. If the person who presents to us uh, already has a known uh, uh, close contact with a confirmed case that's linked to the Wuhan cluster, then the clinical threshold is even lower. Instead of pneumonia or lower tract illness, these kind of con close contacts, we took any degree of um, uh, symptom or severity of, of, of acute respiratory illness uh, as enough to fulfill the suspect case. So, meaning someone who is uh, known to be, let's say, uh, the brother of uh, someone who has a, uh, a confirmed case of, uh, of uh, COVID and uh, comes in with just a simple cough with the chest actually is clear, already fulfills this uh, suspect uh, criteria. So, using this uh, suspect uh, definition, uh, this is the very first case that uh, presented in Singapore. And uh, this patient presented to our emergency department in SGH. And he's a 66 year old um, Chinese male. He is a tourist from Wuhan. And he came into Singapore on the 20th of January. The very following day, he developed a fever as well as a cough. He had no known uh, prior exposure to uh, the known cases at that time uh, in Wuhan. And uh, as you can see, this X-ray shows uh, bilateral infiltrates more obvious on the on the right as well. So which already fulfilled the definition of uh, pneumonia and someone of uh, being a resident of Wuhan. Um, on his uh, initial laboratory testing, his uh, full blood count was normal. His uh, C-reactive protein was uh, elevated at 91, and his uh, procalcitonin reading was uh, 0 0.08 indicative of, uh, of an infective process, but uh, not a bacterial process. So that made a viral illness uh, even more suspicious. So this patient was actually accompanied by uh, his whole family uh, on a Chinese New Year vacation. So very common uh, nowadays uh, for people from mainland China during their long uh, period of Chinese New Year to uh, actually go overseas for vacation. And unfortunately, this was the very first time that this index case uh, was actually overseas. It was actually his first holiday abroad, unfortunately. Um, he was admitted together with his son, who was also found to be infected. Uh, the wife of the son, as well as the, the, the children, meaning the patient's grandchildren, were also found to be infected. During that time of diagnosis, they were already, they already crossed the border uh, into Malaysia and they were hospitalized in Malaysia. So this whole family, unfortunately, were like separated and they were uh, in isolated in different countries. For this patient, in that case, uh, he required supplemental oxygen, intranasal oxygen up to four liters a minute. As you can see, his uh, X-ray eventually also progressed. It got worse. And because of this, uh, the clinical people on the ground decided to uh, start him on Kalitra or Ritonovir Lopinavir. So Kalitra, uh, to those who uh, uh, may not know, is a uh, HIV uh, medication. It's a protease inhibitor. And it has been used uh, experimentally as well as uh, in case uh, series and case reports on patients uh, who had SARS. And so it was extrapolated to this condition. Right? So as you recognize, this was very early on in, uh, in the course of outbreak where um, um, treatment uh, modalities and antivirus were not yet known. So we were you know, limited to extrapolating from uh, the previous experience from treating patients with SARS in 2003. So fortunately, this patient recovered. I can see his uh, X-ray uh, closer towards uh, the end of his uh, inpatient stay uh, was much clearer. He was eventually weaned off oxygen. He didn't have, uh, unfortunately, quite prolonged viral shedding and therefore he had to spend almost one month uh, in our isolation facility 
until he could be cleared of uh, COVID-19. So back to uh, case definitions. Case definitions is uh, actually very, very important. It is important uh, to, to be used to identify potential suspects. It is also important to know that uh, in such cases, case definitions uh, needs to evolve fast, needs to adapt fast with the changing local as well as international epidemiology. It needs to keep track of the recent uh, findings, uh, scientific findings in terms of how long is the incubation period, what kind of symptoms do these patients present. And therefore, uh, in our hospital, we had to certainly keep up with the national definitions as uh, provided and decided upon uh, nationally by the Ministry of Health of Singapore. But in addition to this, what did SGH do? It always uh, tried to add on a buffer zone. A buffer zone meaning that we wanted to catch, uh, uh, we wanted to lower the threshold for this uh, case definition to catch more people. Of course, what is uh, the cost of doing this? The cost of doing this means that you have more suspect cases and therefore you have more people whom you needed to consider to be isolated. And this will then uh, increase the workload as well as the stress Hello, level Papa. for patients, uh, I mean for, for, for people who are working in the isolation ward. Right? It will also definitely because of this uh, buffer zone, if you create this buffer zone, it will then mean that you will also isolate patients who are not uh, who will eventually be diagnosed as not having COVID-19. And uh, admitting patients to isolation uh, in a single room is not, uh, can sometimes not be not a very pleasant experience for the patient. However, by using this buffer zone, it actually allows us to identify uh, the, the first locally transmitted case in Singapore, which I will show you in the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, a description of the first documented uh, community transmission. It is actually a young lady, a Singaporean permanent resident who has been in Singapore for the past five years. And this uh, lady works in the medicine hall. And she actually deals with a lot of uh, clientele who are mini tourists from mainland China. So um, these uh, tourists uh, from mainland China, they come to visit Singapore and then they, uh, some of them will go in tour groups. And some of these tour groups, they will arrange uh, visits to uh, places of interest. And one of the places of interest happens to be this uh, medicine hall. So she actually presented with a uh, history of fever and sore throat for two days. She actually went uh, first to a different hospital, not SGH. During the time of presentation, her x-ray was normal. So if you uh, refer to the previous uh, suspect national uh, definition of a uh, suspect, uh, she will automatically not fulfill this uh, two ways. Number one, she is not someone who comes from uh, Wuhan or anywhere from mainland China. Uh, so during that time when she presented, the, the definition changed from Wuhan to, uh, to uh, the whole of mainland China already. So even that, using that, she did not fulfill uh, that, that uh, uh, criteria. Number two, also she did not fulfill uh, the criteria for a pneumonia or a severe uh, uh, acute respiratory illness. What she had was essentially a mild upper respiratory tract illness. So obviously by using the national definition at that time, she would not have fulfilled it. And, and because this was uh, used, she was uh, discharged from this uh, hospital's uh, emergency department. So she then presented four days later because her symptoms were not improving. By then she had, was uh, day six of illness. And fortunately when she presented to us, there were already more indications that something is not right. So during that time, her x-ray has really changed to uh, show more abnormalities. You can see uh, more infiltrates in the right lower zone and more markedly over the left uh, lower zone, especially in this area as well. So there was obvious change. Uh, the actually is now abnormal. And in addition to that, uh, looking at her initial blood test, uh, the full blood count already showed a, a picture of bicytopenia. So there was leukopenia, low white cell count, as well as a low uh, platelet count. And so on and all with this, together with the symptoms of fever and sore throat, was uh, very suspicious of a viral uh, kind of pneumonia. And therefore, with this presentation and because of our buffer zone, uh, we actually uh, isolated her immediately when she presented to us. And her choke swab subsequently confirmed that she did have uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
and uh, it was besides uh, being the case of the first uh, locally uh, transmitted case, uh, it was also the first uh, household, local household uh, cluster that was described. So she was, uh, she recently gave birth, she was still breastfeeding and her six month infant was uh, infected together with the domestic helper who was in the same household. Fortunately, all of them, including the six month old infant recovered. And as you can see, this is her x-ray on follow up where all the infiltrates that were uh, previously seen has already cleared up. She did not need any specific antiviral therapy. She uh, improved on her own and uh, we just uh, um, symptomatic treatment. So when this case uh, was uh, discovered, then this case then led to the change in the national definition uh, to include those with uh, close contact with uh, people from uh, mainland China. So case definitions and identifying suspects are very important. And besides having, uh, you need to keep pace with the changing epidemiology and developments of the outbreak. So along the way, uh, in this course of outbreak, this case definition has been revised many, many times, taking into account new discoveries as well as um, uh, new information about the disease. So some examples uh, that I can um, uh, uh, tell you is that uh, the case definition also recognized eventually um, this uh, clinical symptom of anosmia, a loss of the sense of smell as an important clinical symptom. So we, when we uh, saw most of these patients, they complaining to us that you know, they, they just totally lost a sense of smell. And we found it in, in, in more and more people. And, and, you know, and as you know, this has been again described uh, very well in the literature as well. And, this, and eventually this was uh, included as uh, part of our uh, uh, clinical symptoms that may define a, a potential suspect. Other examples, uh, we knew that we had to take into account uh, the list of uh, active clusters in Singapore. So it was a dynamic list that changes according to uh, information. So some clusters or active clusters that were identified are yeah. some clusters uh, uh, as other religious uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sites as well. Another big uh, cluster was the Mustafa cluster. So Mustafa is a shopping mall, a very popular shopping mall in Singapore that is open 24 hours. So this was a, another active cluster that was uh, uh, quite big at one point in time. So our, our case definitions will include uh, uh, these uh, active clusters and if anyone presented and were found to be or, or were noted to be um, uh, in this uh, cluster within the past uh, two weeks will be uh, automatically be a suspect. Other um, definitions will include uh, taking into account particular risk groups. So in the first, uh, when the first uh, uh, days, early days of outbreak, the main risk, book, risk group was actually uh, mainland China tourists. Then after that, when there was community transmission, then the suspect criteria was widened to include frontline staff. So these are staff who deals with uh, tourists. So the people who are working in the tourism sector in the hospitality sector were were the ones that uh, we wanted to uh, um, uh, clarify as suspects. Then after that, uh, when COVID-19 spread to the whole world, um, returning travelers also became a, a, a risk for, uh, peop uh, for people with, uh, at risk of COVID-19. Together with returning travelers, uh, foreign expatriates who uh, return uh, from their place or from their country of birth back to Singapore to work were also at risk. And finally, I think you um, probably have read this in, in the media and the news, uh, our major outbreak from uh, foreign workers living in dormitories in cramped living conditions. And right as of date, uh, the majority of our cases are still foreign workers who are living in dormitories. So this is a, a very good summary of uh, how we uh, re-stratify uh, our Cases. So when a patient, let's say, comes in, presents with, uh, uh, with a complaint in the emergency department, how do we decide what is a suspect case, what is a suspicious case uh, of that we think that we need to test for COVID-19? It is, we divide it into uh, the two main criteria. So obviously, the first one will be the epidemiological criteria, and then there will be the clinical criteria, what the symptoms that the patient present with. So starting with the epidemiological 
epidemiology criteria as of now because the majority of our cases are are indeed uh, foreign workers uh, living in dormitories so that's uh, is actually the highest risk factor right and then after that the following risk factors will follow right so those uh, close contacts if you uh, recent contact of a known case if you are working in occupations uh, uh, deemed to be a higher risk of exposure to COVID-19 and the examples are provided here so an example of people who are actually um, uh, working in areas that would be of high risk would be obviously if you're working in a hospital right or if you're working in what we call dorm dormitory operations so these are people who are employed uh, to let's say take choke swaps in the dormitories or they are employed as security guards uh, in the foreign worker dormitories these people although they are supposed to be wearing gowns and gloves as well as uh, surgical masks are still at risk right there are also let's say even Cleaners, cleaners who are uh, working to clean up the isolation or the quarantine facilities, these are also uh, uh, people whom we recognize are, are, are at a higher risk of acquiring COVID-19. Right? So the, the list follows down and uh, all the way down to uh, eventually the general population, someone who has no contact at all, not working in, in, in the high risk occupations. Right, so this is the epidemiological risk. And as of now, um, although our, the majority of cases are still foreign workers in dormitories, we know that we are seeing more and more cases of uh, people who are returning from overseas. So these are our overseas uh, returnees. Um, and and um, the, uh, we are getting more and more of these uh, imported cases. Uh, people who are coming back from places like India, from Philippines, who are testing positive. So this, if we see this triangle, perhaps this, uh, uh, this current risk factor of being travel about may actually go up uh, one step higher now. Then moving on to the clinical criteria, uh, you can see that uh, obviously a viral, someone who presents with viral pneumonia will be at the highest uh, 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 suspicion for COVID-19. And then after that, then the other clinical features will follow. And you can see, for example, the loss of uh, the sense of uh, smell or anosmia quite high on the list as well. Okay, so the lessons that were learned in terms of case definitions, number one, it needs to be very, very specific. <clears throat> it needs to be very, very clear because when you uh, define, uh, uh, when you um, drop case definitions for suspects, uh, these case definitions will then be interpreted by the frontline staff, the doctor who is working in the emergency department seeing the patient for the first time, or the general practitioner in his own clinic Right, who is seeing a case uh, 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 from the community for the first time. So, and they will need to refer to these case definitions. So this case definitely needs to be very specific. And the second one, the second point, as I've shown you, is that it needs to be very dynamic. You need the case definitions to be, uh, to keep up with the latest uh, epidemiological findings, both internationally and locally. And if practical, as you can see what we did uh, in SGH, we tried to add a buffer zone, right? And essentially, it allows us to uh, operate a more inclusive uh, case suspect definition, such that we catch uh, we catch more people in hope that we will not miss out a, a case of COVID nineteen, right? So of course, as uh, I stressed uh, earlier on, by creating this buffer zone, it means that you also catch more suspects, and you will then load your load your um, uh, your your patients into the isolation ward, and that will then. Uh, come with other other costs as well. So we need to be able to balance this as much as possible. So moving uh, away from case definitions, if we come to diagnostics, um, the main uh, tool to diagnose COVID-19 comes from using um, RT-PCR, so reverse uh, transcriptase uh, PCR method. So we knew that to have uh, uh, this uh, uh, working test, it needs to be of uh, good sensitivity as well as specificity. Even more important is that it needs to have a rapid turnaround time because a test that comes in two to three days later is not going to be uh, very useful. So diagnostics allow us to identify case in a timely manner. So if it is positive, then you are able to um, um, put up the appropriate isolation precautions as well as manage the, the patient uh, clinically. 
and if you can confirm a case to be negative, then that case will then continue to receive the appropriate medical care. So this is the first uh, in-house molecular uh, PCR test that uh, our own lab developed. It was based on a modified protocol from WHO. There are two genes that will be tested. The first one will be the E gene on, of the virus, and then it is used a different uh, uh, target, the RDRP, uh, or in the open reading frame one, as a confirmatory test. So the E gene uh, is actually present in both SARS and SARS-CoV-2. And if it's, so it's used like a screening test to uh, look for uh, COVID. And then once it's positive, then uh, the, 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 the test will then look for the RDRP gene that will then differentiate SARS-CoV-2 from, uh, for example, SARS. Now, after that, then the lab then evolved to uh, bring in commercial systems. So it decided to then, after a while, bring in the uh, Roche-Cobas uh, uh, system which allowed uh, it to increase the output of tests, the number of tests that could be done. So again, it, uh, all these uh, molecular tests mainly operate on the same principle. It will usually have two targets. In this case, in this for this spiker test, it will target the open reading frame 1A as well as the e-gene regions. It's a very low detection limit, meaning that it's quite sensitive. It can detect up to uh, 22 copies of, uh, of the virus per mil. And it has also no cross reactivity with uh, other important coronaviruses, for example, MERS or the other human coronaviruses. So um, the lab, after using the in-house, eventually then tested out this commercial kit. And this commercial kit allowed them to increase the number of tests that could be uh, handled uh, daily. Uh, on top of that, um, another part of the lab also invested in uh, getting in a, a rapid PCR test. So this is from CFIT. It is a cartridge system. Again, same principle, it will use two genes, one to screen and then one to confirm. Now, the advantage of this rapid, or what is it called rapid, is that it's not batch. So it doesn't wait for the whole plate to be filled up with, let's say, 60 or 100 tests before the test is run. So any test, uh, it can be done in real time. So if a patient comes in at 3 a.m. and for whatever reason, the clinician suspects that it could be COVID-19 and you want a test to be done, the test can be collected and be run at the same time. And the turnaround time is less than six hours. It's usually up to two to three hours. So that patients admitted into the ward at 3 a.m. will actually can potentially have a positive or negative result already available by 6 a.m. Right? So that's the, the utility of this uh, rapid PCR test. And that allowed us to actually, uh, uh, this, this fast turnaround time uh, was very helpful. So imagine if a patient who was ended up in the general ward for the past maybe two days, and then suddenly developed, uh, found to develop a cough and the clinician on the ground is concerned, you know, could this be COVID-19 that uh, we miss uh, on screening? So then instead of transferring the patient up to the isolation ward immediately, uh, one option is to run this rapid test and leave the patient in the general ward still because the rest of the patients in the same ward have already been exposed, right? So it reduces patient movement and all that, right? Um, so so the, uh, we found this test, this uh, rapid PCR test to be actually very, very useful. The sensitivity and specificity of it is actually equivalent to um, the other tests that we are using. So the other major thing, uh, major diagnostic that we use besides molecular or PCR testing is actually serology testing. So serology testing uh, is also very useful because it allows us to retrospectively identify uh, cases, especially those that are tested PCR negative from their uh, throat swabs or from their nasopharyngeal swabs. So it's a very, very important tool in contact tracing and also to investigate uh, how, uh, what was the chain of transmission. In the asymptomatic cases that we have quite a lot, uh, having a serology test will also allow us to estimate how far in is this patient into his timeline of illness. Because we know that uh, in, within the first week or the first two weeks of illness, um, the, quite a, the majority of patients would not have zero converted yet and will expect their serology during that time to be negative. So this is our serology kit that, uh, that the lab used. This is from Abbott. Uh, it, is, uh, it tests against the immunoglobulin G to uh, nucleocapsid protein. 
So these are the sensitivities here. As you can see for this particular test uh, that the lab ev evaluated, if the patient presented uh, less than two weeks before the onset of uh, clinical symptoms, only about one third will, will be positive. Whereas if the, if the patient was beyond uh, two weeks from onset of clinical symptoms, we knew that the majority of them will be positive. So a patient who um, uh, is tested uh, uh, negative and PCR positive, for example, we know that then they will be within, usually most likely within the two weeks of the onset of illness. In terms of uh, specificity, it actually cross reacts with SARS, but um, um, we have very few uh, uh, SARS survivors uh, um, that actually have presented to um, um, our hospital at this point in time. And uh, if we are, and these SARS survivors, uh, we would know like, from the clinical history. So it wasn't a, a major, a major, uh, 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 it wasn't a major uh, issue uh, in terms of interpreting the test. So in terms of where to swap, this is an uh, audit uh, done by the National uh, um, uh, Center for Infectious Disease. This is another host, different major hospital in Singapore. And looking at the data here, you can see that if you uh, take a combination of swaps from the nasopharynx as well as the oropharynx, this will give, this will give us the highest uh, sensitivity. So uh, our pickup will be best when we use both nasopharyngeal as well as oropharyngeal swaps. Is what we are doing right now in uh, when we test our patients in the isolation wards. So what are the lessons learned in terms of diagnostic testing? Uh, we knew that we needed to have a very good uh, diagnostic platform and the turnaround time needs to be uh, short, right? as short as possible. And this is a very, very important tool in any kind of uh, infectious disease outbreak. Uh, apart from having a very good platform, it's also very important to uh, uh, to know how to interpret the test, like any other um, uh, kind of test that we send for. Right? We need to know what are the possible causes of false negative as well as false positive results. And the clinician on the ground also, uh, we, we need to you know, appreciate the various factors that can affect the test results. Right? What is the pre-test probability? So you know, if we send a swab for a foreign worker who stays in a dormitory coming in with a fever and cough, the pre-test probability is going to be very, very high in Singapore, right? As opposed to a patient who is, for example, homebound, who has uh, lung cancer and comes in with a chronic cough, right? And x-ray abnormalities uh, with no contact, uh, with no known contact to any uh, uh, known cases of COVID-19, the pre-test probability in that case would be probably be quite low. So pre-test probability is going to be very, a very important uh, 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 clinical kind of uh, uh, factor that we want to factor in. Uh, so if your, if that foreign worker that I mentioned previously uh, tested negative in the first uh, uh, PCR test, would you, uh, we will definitely not de-isolate the patient first. In fact, we'll be repeating the test 24 hours later. We will also be considering whether we should be doing serology, right? However, if uh, this negative test was uh, on the patient with lung cancer that I mentioned earlier, then we know because the pre-test probability is going to be very low, then you'll be more assured that after the, if you do the second test, if it's negative, you are ready to de-isolate the patient. We also need to uh, clarify where was the site of sampling because we know um, the site of sampling can actually affect the sensitivity and how the sampling is done. Also need to factor in the possibility of operator uh, dependence, right? Some people uh, swap better than others. That one is just a human factor that you just need to take into account, right? The other important is the day of illness, right? So some patients will present on, let's say, day one of, uh, of onset, sometimes uh, may actually be falsely negative. Uh, clinical severity also plays a role. And we have encountered uh, cases of possible laboratory cross-contamination, meaning that, uh, for example, if you use the uh, COBAS, the Roche system, which, has, uh, which allows you to uh, do a, a lot of uh, tests at one go, um, the wells where contain, which contains the patient specimens are very close to each other. So a very positive uh, 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 case uh, may actually cross-contaminate uh, next, the next uh, uh, another patient sample next to it and may result in a false positive re uh, result. Fortunately, we have had only one or two of those uh, instances uh, which we were, we were able to uh, uh, eventually uh, clarify. 
So all this needs to be done in close communication with the laboratory, especially when uh, tests come up with, let's say, inconclusive results. We will usually communicate very closely with the uh, laboratory uh, people to ask what's the reason for the inconclusive test, whether or not was it a low signal and all that. So it was also very helpful in, in helping us to interpret uh, uh, certain um, results. Moving along to clinical management of COVID-19, um, as we know, 80% are fortunately asymptomatic to mild, <clears throat> and these patients actually end up only receiving symptomatic treatment, but uh, up to 20% can experience moderate to severe illness. And in this 20%, what did we do? Uh, we have tried on antiviral therapy. In the early days, we started with uh, the Kalitra, Lopinavir, Ritonovir. Uh, we have used interferon uh, beta in uh, some cases as well. Before the data were uh, eventually known about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, we did uh, start one patient on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. As you know, uh, right now, based on the current literature, this uh, combination of hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin is not recommended. We also participated in uh, trials to use remdesivir, another uh, antiviral agent. Convalescent plasma, we have not used it in uh, SGH so far for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, but uh, there is a convalescent plasma national project spearheaded by a uh, different hospital, the National uh, Center for Infectious Disease. And we knew that if we had a patient that, uh, that we think required convalescent plasma, we will be able to obtain plasma from, uh, from our uh, neighboring hospital for treatment. We also have to work very, very closely with our respiratory and critical care colleagues. Um, and in our isolation ward, there is a dedicated uh, ICU team, isolation ward ICU team, uh, who will actually manage uh, the ICU cases. And these are typically uh, COVID-19 cases that require uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation or high flow uh, uh, oxygen or even uh, uh, NIV. So, um, and together with our colleagues from the respiratory uh, medicine, we had to introduce various supporting measures, supportive measures. So um, we actually tried on awake proning uh, on, on some patients as well. So um, the literature out there suggests that, you know, proning is, is uh, actually helps to improve uh, the oxygenation. And this is uh, one proning is one of the uh, methods uh, used to improve uh, oxygen, oxygenation in ventilated patients. But you know that, you know, the, the procedure of proning is actually quite simple. And uh, why not uh, try to introduce this to a patient who is already on oxygen even before in, uh, the patient is, uh, requires uh, intubation. And there's some literature out there about, uh, about this. Uh, besides that, we also had to introduce uh, um, high flow oxygen delivery as well as uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation in our negative pressure isolation rooms. But more than that, uh, we also brought in our palliative medicine colleagues as well as social services. We have had a few, unfortunately, a few deaths uh, in the ICU from COVID-19 pneumonia. And uh, it was important for us to provide uh, support for uh, the grieving families. So this is a totally different kind of uh, situation from uh, um, uh, uh, other ICU deaths because unfortunately such uh, uh, the families of uh, such patients are not allowed to go into the room, so they can't touch the, the patient, they can't physically be with the patient, and it can be actually quite uh, distressing to the, to the family. So we needed our palliative colleagues as well as, as, well as our social workers to help to support uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, grieving families. Uh, we also needed to provide psychosocial support for the non-residents. As you know, our majority of our cases are actually foreign workers um, and, and their families are all, you know, not, not around. So a lot of them do have a lot of psychosocial issues as well. And because of this, we had to um, use a lot of uh, uh, technology such as uh, video conferencing, WhatsApp, uh, even FaceTime uh, to allow uh, patients to connect with their loved ones. And another important part of uh, clinical management was also our rehab colleagues. So our rehab colleagues were uh, very important in uh, uh, returning deconditioned, recovered ICU uh, patients back to their baseline. 
and we also saw that we had to deal with a lot of other different uh, after effects of COVID-19. So, I mean, the more direct one would be uh, patients who have prolonged intubation, uh, eventually requiring tricostomy. So we needed help from our uh, uh, ENT, ENO stroke uh, colleagues to um, uh, operate and um, perform tricostomies. Uh, we realized that quite a number of patients actually presented with myocardial infarction or even myocarditis, and that's where our cardiovascular colleagues had to come in. Again, a number of patients come in, came in with ischemic strokes. Once, uh, one was severe enough to require um, a posterior craniectomy, decompression uh, craniectomy uh, because of uh, cerebellar ischemic strokes. Uh, had some patients coming in with a, a, a Goulain Barre like syndrome, a demonitating polyneuropathy. Uh, and we had quite a handful of uh, patients coming in presenting with Bell's palsy as well. So again, then from there, our neurology colleagues uh, had to come in to help uh, manage uh, such patients. I remember one case of a young uh, gentleman, a uh, confirmed case of COVID-19, who then uh, was found to have subacute thyroiditis or any other etiology. And we uh, attributed, eventually attributed the cause of the thyroiditis to COVID-19. Um, appendicitis, actually we have seen quite a number of cases of uh, foreign workers, um, uh, COVID-19 positive who comes in with um, um, uh, right alert for some pain and eventually found to be appendicitis. Now, whether or not there is a direct link between COVID-19 and appendicitis, it is not uh, uh, something that we know for sure. But it's just that we, we do see, we have seen quite a bit of, of uh, cases of appendicitis uh, in, in COVID-19 patients for whatever reason. And because of this, we even had to get in some of our surgical colleagues to, uh, to do appendicectomy. And moving beyond cases, uh, we also had uh, a lot of uh, requirement for support services, so respiratory and physiotherapists. Uh, we needed our radiology colleagues uh, to be around as well. And of course, uh, those people working in the operating theatres. So this, um, a lot of our services um, and our different departments were, uh, were split into dedicated uh, isolation on what you call dirty teams. There were dedicated scan rooms as well as operating theatres just to uh, serve the suspect as well as confirm COVID-19 cases and that led to uh, specific uh, patient transfer protocols. Right, so these are some examples of some checklists that we uh, needed to come up with uh, in terms of uh, transport. We wanted to transfer, uh, let's say, a patient uh, confirmed case of COVID-19 intubated who needed, for example, a CT scan. Right, so we need to, to figure out how to transport such positive cases uh, to the CT scan room which is quite a, 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 a hassle actually. So we even had to have uh, different protocols for, for transfers, right? what to do, what is the route, uh, which lift to take, how is the lift to be clean. We needed security to actually cordon off the area to make sure that, um, let's say visitors as well as other clean patients do not come into contact when the transfer is in process. So what are the lessons learned in terms of uh, clinical management? Uh, we needed to appreciate the wide spectrum of uh, the illness, right? the clinical severity, as well as the different kind of uh, disease uh, presentations. Um, it was during this time that uh, I uh, really appreciated the need for well-designed clinical trials, because this is the, among the first time that uh, we were dealing with something that we uh, never knew. It was a completely novel disease, and uh, we were at quite a loss, actually, uh, what to give to a very sick patient with COVID-19, apart from just very good supportive care, very good ICU care. Right, we, were, we felt that our hands were tight. Right? We didn't have any uh, antivirals or good drugs to give. Right? It's very different from treating uh, bacterial infection with antibiotics. And uh, we realized that uh, we really appreciated the, the efforts to, that we needed to uh, collaborate within the different uh, specialties, right? from rehab medicine to the ICU specialist to the respiratory physicians. Another important part is actually the reorganization of areas. So, uh, for example, the emergency department, uh, we had to have a fever screening area. Actually, there was already a fever zone already earmarked for this, but uh, when COVID-19 came, the fever screening area was upgraded to uh, allow for isolation. Right? In terms of outpatient services, there had to be visitor screening and as well as thermal scans. We knew that we needed to ramp up the isolation walk capacity, as well as prepare more ICU beds to anticipate a possible surge in uh, uh, 
uh, in, in patients requiring ICU care. And besides providing the space for it, we also knew that we needed to provide enough manpower as well as equipment. Uh, the other important aspect is uh, what, uh, what we term as acute respiratory wards. So this, I would uh, go into a bit more detail. So essentially this is, the idea of this is converting uh, some wards for admitted patients who have essentially acute respiratory symptoms, but they do not fulfill the suspect criteria for COVID-19. Right? And in these wards, the visitor policy is restricted. Uh, at one point, visits were completely not allowed, and there is strict use of personal protective equipment. So uh, in our respiratory wards, doctors who come to see these patients will be on glove and gown, as well as N95 masks, as well as uh, having a face shield. And uh, these wards were also reconfigured. So we, uh, the patient beds were separated into uh, to be spaced out to be uh, more than two meters. And all this is the aim of all this is actually to reduce the collateral damage in newly diagnosed COVID cases. So this is an example that I can demonstrate here. This is a patient, an 82-year-old, who is essentially an unlinked community case. He actually came in just for an accidental fall, right? He actually actually fractured his uh, cheekbone, but he also told the doctors in emergency department they had one week of fever with dry cough. So eventually, his uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR from throat swab actually came out positive. Um, and looking at what was the collateral damage, because he had a fever, he was managed in the fever zone and was isolated promptly. There was no potential exposure in the emergency department. He had exposure to two other patients when he was admitted to the acute respiratory ward. But if you compare it to the general ward where patients can be uh, cohorted up to more than five people, uh, the numbers of uh, patients exposed were uh, reduced dramatically. And there was also importantly no exposure to healthcare staff because all of them were already uh, carried for the patient while being on full uh, PPE, right? From the uh, emergency department all the way up to the acute respiratory ward. So the people who were exposed to this patient were only two, right? And uh, I cannot go away from this talk without mentioning the important role of the infection control team as well as the epidemiology team. So the infection control team was important in putting up the policies for PPE, or uh, deciding or, or coming up with protocols of how to clean or how to decontaminate rooms as well as medical equipment. It's also important in devising how to transfer patients uh, uh, positive cases within the hospital, right from scans to uh, operating theaters, how to transport such patients. A uh, very important part is also the training of healthcare workers in terms of mask fitting, in terms of uh, auditing, as well as uh, uh, training for um, uh, PPE practices, as well as the use of um, the PAPR, right? And the epidemiology team was uh, again another very important one because it was uh, needed for contact tracing of every positive case that was uh, uh, found in the uh, in 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 the hospital. Um, and the other thing that was important was obviously <coughs> the command center or the task force, and uh, it needed to be very organized up top, and also it needed to bring the message down to the bottom. And there were daily emails that were given to all staff working in the hospital. And it is in these uh, routine instructions, right? And uh, if you look at the routine instructions, it is very all encompassing. It will update you about the, what is the latest case suspect definition. It will tell you about what is being done, in, uh, usually done for the management of uh, suspect and confirmed cases, what to test for, uh, how, how, many, how many swaps you must take and all that. It will update the, the staff about where are the wards that are, that, are, that are used for such cases. So what are the current isolation wards? What is our, where are our current acute respiratory wards as well? As well as inform the staff about the latest infection prevention control practices, right? And even also advising staff who are unwell, where to go to about, uh, how about our uh, the opening hours of the staff clinic and all that. So of course, um, no man is an island. So uh, we are still operating in a country with other hospitals as well. And uh, if we uh, uh, only control what we have, uh, what, what we have in our hospital, we knew that uh, the community outbreak will still continue. 
So we need to work very closely with uh, the Ministry of Health as well as the other hospitals. And the uh, Ministry of Health will then allocate uh, positive cases or severely ill ICU cases to us, uh, all in the name of load balancing. So we, didn't, we, we knew that we needed to share the load between our different hospitals as well. Um, it also allowed us to uh, have a multi-center participation in clinical studies. So for example, we were involved in the remdesivir clinical trials and we have uh, used quite a number of, uh, of, uh, of patients on remdesivir as well. Um, the outbreaks in the foreign worker dormitories uh, really put our, our coordination into tests. We had to mobilize various uh, mobile medical teams. So these are typically teams consisting of surgeons because surgeons right now not much work to do because they had to cancel all of their electives. And so they were then mobilized out to um, the, as medical teams in the dormitories to do swaps, to attend to um, the foreign workers who come in with uh, various uh, clinical complaints. And we also had to receive uh, direct transfers for inpatient admissions. Let's say if uh, some of these uh, uh, people who are staying in dormitories or are positive uh, are unwell enough to require admission. And once we sort them out, then we need to also coordinate the decanment to, decanment to uh, specific uh, isolation recovery facilities. And nowadays, we are also receiving more and more transfers of uh, overseas cases, uh, be it COVID and non-COVID as well. So this is my summary slide um, as to what uh, I've gone through. Um, so again, case definition is important uh, and it needs to be uh, as up to date as possible with uh, what we know in terms of the disease epidemiology. Um, testing is also very important. And so far, uh, we, are, we are actually very fortunate to have uh, good testing platforms. We clinically, we recognize the broad clinical spectrum Patients can come in totally asymptomatic or they come in with a totally unrelated uh, illness, for example, a myocardial infection or even a, a stroke. Um, very important was the reorganizing of the uh, wards, especially the acute respiratory wards, which helped us to um, actually um, um, diagnose se several community acquired uh, COVID-19 cases and then reduce the uh, potential nosocomial transmission. Infection control and epi was uh, the other one that I pointed out. And uh, it was important to have a very good uh, hospital leadership to actually lead the fight against COVID-19. And all this is uh, actually part of uh, our national effort la, to um, actually uh, work against uh, the transmission and spread of COVID-19. As of now, uh, again, the majority of cases that we are detected are still from uh, foreign workers from dormitories. Thankfully, at this point in time, after the what we call a circuit breaker or a period or a lockdown period, uh, our community cases have been uh, cut down to, uh, to single digits for now. And we are hoping that um, the situation will stay the same for now. Okay, I'm the end of my talk. Um, any questions? Okay, thank you very much to Dr. Benjamin for the complete explanation about this topic. It is very interesting and very useful for us. Uh, I personally found, found several new information about COVID-19. Uh, there are many updates and many new information, particularly about the sequel of COVID-19. I personally do not know yet. Uh, about approximately two weeks ago, I also found a patient diagnosed with appendicitis and then uh, the swab is uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive. So I just know this from this webinar that it is real. At mm. first, I think that it is not connected each other, but it turns out that connect appendicitis could be the sequel of appendicitis. Uh, appendicitis could be the sequel of SARS-CoV, yeah, Dr. Ben. It's very informative, Dr. Ben. Last week, we can yeah, uh, found the patient with the appendicitis yeah. and the COVID-19 positive with threat. And more, thank you for the... Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Ben, we have already had several questions from the audience about this topic. Uh, I would like to uh, I would like to I will read the questions from the audience. The first one is the question, uh, Dr. Ben, from the resident of pulmonology department. Uh, he is asking about the asymptomatic case of COVID nineteen patient. Is it as infectious as those who have symptoms? That's the first question, Dr. Ben. Would you uh, please, Dr. Ben? Uh, 
uh, sorry, I think Renaissance was muted. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I see that they are actually equally, uh, likely to be equally infectious because we find that the viral loads uh, from the throat swabs are actually uh, the same. So asymptomatic uh, uh, patients, their viral loads can be actually quite high. And, and therefore we believe that um, the, the, the risk of transmission is actually, is actually there. Okay, so it's just as infectious, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben, for the answer. And then we are going to the next question. Uh, the next question is about the mortality of patients with COVID-19, doctor. Uh, it is said in the literature that patients who has a higher high probability to get mortality is those who are old age or having more uh, having a comorbid like diabetes, hypertension, and others. But turns out in the real life uh, experience, we frequently found a patient with young age who has no comorbid, no history of diabetes, no history of uh, hypertension, and no other comorbid. But turns out the patient deteriorates very progressively and the clinical symptoms very worsens very rapidly and then finally passed away. Is there any specific explanation why can this patient fall into a very bad uh, clinical symptoms and then finally passed away, although not having any comorbid that have been? Uh, yes, I, I agree that uh, the majority of uh, deaths are typically those who are older. Um, so far, we have not seen, uh, fortunately, I have not seen uh, young, uh, relatively young uh, uh, um, but I think uh, for the ones who are younger with no comorbidities, um, the issue of uh, morbidity and mortality may be uh, more related to the excessive uh, hyperinflammatory response. So it's not just the direct uh, uh, virus itself, but the, the patient's uh, immune response that, uh, to the infection that is so overwhelming that results in the organ failure. Okay, so it uh, it backs to the hyperinflammation uh, reaction that from the patient itself himself, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. so uh, some a uh, next question regarding this issue, Dr. Ben. So, is it useful to consume uh, drugs that can uh, induce or boost our immune yeah. system? Is it having yeah. a good impact or turns out to bring negative impact and then? brings out to the hyperinflammation phase, Dr. Ben? Um, we have not really uh, used uh, such, any of such uh, uh, medications actually in terms of uh, the immune system. Uh, most of our treatment has been actually been supportive. We have done some, uh, uh, we have actually tried uh, things like remdesivir as well, but not uh, immune boosters. Okay. So, uh, uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. So the evidence is not uh, clear yet, yeah, Dr. Ben. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Ben, we still have another question. This comes from uh, Amalia. She is the second year medical student in Fakultas Kedokteran Usu. Uh, good morning, Dr. Ben. Uh, I would like to ask what factors make convalescent plasma therapy not successful in some critical patients. Uh, is there any specific explanation or any adverse effect of convalescent plasma therapy? Uh, so convalescent plasma, okay, so I would say that we have not had a case that we needed to... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Evidence for it, again, is also not uh, that great, but uh, why would certain... Why would it not work? Uh, it depends on the quality of the plasma that's collected. Uh, so it depends on how, how good is the preparation of the plasma. So for example, uh, how NCID does it is that it will screen the donors and uh, it only takes certain donors above uh, a certain level of uh, what we call neutralizing antibody. Again, all these things are still experimental and actually we do not know how much, uh, um, what is the good level to take in terms of uh, level of neutralizing antibodies. Mm. And actually, all these are actually just surrogate markers, and we actually do not really know for sure how effective is uh, convalescent plasma. In terms of what are the uh, risks, uh, adverse effects of uh, convalescent plasma, it would be same as uh, giving any other uh, intravenous immunoglobulin. So it would be 
uh, fluid overload, uh, potential for acute renal uh, uh, failure, uh, as well as maybe uh, uh, allergic reactions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's very depends on the neutralizing antibody titers and then the patient itself. Yeah, Dr. Ben. Okay, Dr. Ben, thank you for the explanation. Uh, we still have several questions, Dr. Ben. I hope that you still have time to answer all these questions. Uh, another question from, come from our student, the first year of medical student uh, named Alfat. Alfat is asking, uh, good morning, doctor. In the last few months, the number of Indonesian who think that COVID-19 is just a conspiracy has increased and it resulted in more and more people who no longer obey the government policy on health protocols. And they argue that even, even they are not wearing masks, even they are traveling anywhere and gathered, they're still not infected. So they do not trust in COVID-19 infection. And this make we as a health workers uh, is getting higher infection, higher risk to get infected. So what can we do as a health workers to make them aware of this infection, Dr. Ben? It's a very uh, typical tragedy in Indonesia that many Indonesian people still do not believe that this infection is real. So they don't care with the health policy protocols. What can we do, Dr. Ben? I unfortunately don't have a very good answer for that. Uh, it is, I, I, I understand it's a very, uh, it is not a problem that is uh, limited to Indonesia. I mean, we do have uh, uh, people in Singapore with the same viewpoint as well. Uh, thankfully, not many, um, but you can see what's happening in the US as well. Unfortunately, uh, this is all human nature. Uh, I think people are still, um, people are still uh, allowed their, their opinions. Um, and I think uh, the main thing right now is that in this age of information technology, uh, information is so widely available and therefore uh, um, it is very easy to spread false information and therefore all these conspiracy theories will exist. Um, we can try our, our best to uh, educate people to uh, um, um, the appropriate media and all that, but uh, it is it's very tough because you realize that a lot of uh, people who uh, consume all these conspiracy theories, they also get their information from different different uh, 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 news, uh, different, it's not from mainstream news. So, you know, it, it's very hard for, for us to, you know, in, so-called infiltrate or influence these other uh, alternative uh, uh, um, uh, uh, media or alternative uh, online kind of uh, uh, news to be able to send our message out. So, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a good solution for this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, there are still several other questions. Another question comes from a resident of pulmonology as well, Dr. Ben. Uh, he's asking that at first, definition of getting recovered of COVID-19 from WHO is a two times a swab negative of PCR. But then uh, we have, WHO revised the definition of getting recovered now 10 days of isolation and three days of free of symptoms. In Singapore, do you still use uh, two times of swab negative PCR to define patient as recovered or how, what, how, how what happens in Singapore to, say, to state okay. patient is being recovered? Okay, so uh, yes, in the beginning, we were using uh, two times uh, swab negative 24 hours apart. Uh, after that, um, we have uh, recently changed it to, um, let me think, uh, if they are swapped uh, positive um, and diagnosed as having uh, COVID-19, then uh, one way is to do a repeat uh, COVID-19 swap test on day 14 of illness. If they are swapped negative, they are allowed to be discharged with uh, what we call a leave of absence meaning that they are supposed to uh, stay at home for the next seven days, so up to day 21 of illness, and then they are considered recovered after on day 22 onwards. So for, let's say, a foreign worker staying in a dormitory, this means that uh, these uh, patients can be uh, de-isolated after day 22 of illness. Um, but the problem from all this approach is to identify what is the day of onset, because most of them are asymptomatic. And that's where we have used the serology test as a, 
as a rough uh, marker. So we, we, if a patient who is uh, serology Ig positive for COVID, uh, we take that uh, test date as day 15 of his illness. So there are all these uh, assumptions that we put in. Uh, yeah, so we, we are, we have sort of moved away from uh, uh, two times uh, PCR ne uh, negative as a marker of uh, recovery. Okay, thank you Dr. Ben for the explanation. Another question comes from our medical students. Uh, it is Arif Maulana from the first year of medical student. He is asking, uh, Good morning, Dr. Ben. Is there any similarity between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the in the early case of uh, pandemic SARS-CoV? We use the same treatment of SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, although they both have a different genomic, almost thirty percent difference of entire length uh, genomic sequence. Is it possible using the same treatment of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 to treat? The patient, although they have a very high difference of genomic sequence, Dr. Ben. Uh, so, yeah, the the I would say that right now the treatment of uh, COVID nineteen is very different from uh, the previous SARS. Um, we only use uh, such uh, old SARS treatment only because in the early part of the outbreak, uh, there were no such uh, uh, available uh, clinical information. And therefore, we had to uh, extrapolate it from our previous experience of uh, treating uh, SARS. So right now, certainly, I would say that uh, using things like Kalitra, right, that was uh, previously used to try to treat uh, uh, SARS, uh, it is not uh, um, something that is uh, uh, indicated right now. Lah. No, one, no one does it anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. And then the next question comes from Marola Putapea, Dr. Ben. He is asking, what is your opinion on rapid serology testing used for screening for COVID patient in hospital? Because several times we got a patient with rapid test reactive, but turns out not to be SARS-CoV-2 infection and vice versa. What is your opinion on this thing, Dr. Ben? Yeah, I agree. I mean, we have had uh, quite a bit of uh, such uh, uh, cases as well. So uh, when this, during this part of outbreak, actually the government actually opened up a lot for our, our health science authority actually approved a lot of uh, such uh, tests. And so we had to deal with a lot of false positive uh, results. So um, for, I would not recommend doing such uh, uh, tests uh, within the hospital. Um, uh, for for the issue of it being uh, uh, falsely uh, uh, positive, and uh, yeah, so I, I would not recommend that to be done, uh, especially if you have a uh, good test, uh, uh, alternative test available. So, for example, the rapid PCR test we have, that would be the test that uh, we would uh, would probably uh, 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 rely on rather than this uh, uh, rapid serology test. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. It really depends on the settings of the hospital and the facility of the swab right. test here, Dr. Ben. Okay. Dr. Ben, another questions? I think we still have time. Uh, hopefully yeah. that you are still have yes, all the sure. time, Dr. Ben. Another question from uh, Ruth Siagian, the second year of medical student. He is asking about at-home saliva tests. Uh, do you have any information about at-home saliva tests? It is applicable and needed to diagnose COVID-19 infection. Right, at-home saliva tests? Yes, at-home saliva tests. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we, I don't have much information on that. Uh, during the early part of our outbreak, uh, we did try out uh, using saliva, saliva to uh, run the PCR test. Uh, we had if I remember correctly, sensitivity rate is about maybe 80 plus percent. So it wasn't too bad actually. Um, but uh, no, we have not really uh, done this uh, uh, or, or, or done this uh, outside of the hospital. Okay, so nasopharyngeal swab is still having a higher sensitivity and specificity rate. Right? Yeah. Ben, yeah. Okay, Dr. Ben. Another question, Dr. Ben. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this comes from our final year of medical student named Fan Mati. Uh, he's, she's asking about the why contact tracing start on 
positive test result and not on symptoms and how important it is to implement contact tracing among public. Oh, sorry. So uh, maybe I wasn't clear enough. So when I say contact tracing means that uh, when it starts means that uh, when a positive case is identified, uh, what is being done is that the contact tracing team will then find out what is the when is the first day of uh, onset of symptoms mm -hmm. and then from there they will actually go back 40 hours because we know about the possibility of pre-symptomatic transmission so then contact tracing uh, will then uh, start from uh, two days before the onset of the symptom for that particular case okay yeah. so, so it still it still counts from the first symptom right yeah yes. not the, di the not right. the diagnostic yes okay mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. Another uh, question, Dr. Ben, about the clinical presentation of COVID-19, Dr. Ben. Is, it, is there any specific strain or substrain of SARS-CoV-2 virus, Dr. Ben? Because some patient develops a very high or very bad clinical sign and symptom, but some other patient uh, is asymptomatic. Is there any specific strain or substrain that can explain this phenomenon? Uh, right now, I don't have that kind of uh, information because uh, I think uh, from our side, we have not been able to, uh, I mean, we don't have the facility to actually uh, uh, go down into the type of substrain. Uh, we do see different uh, presentations of the illness, definitely. Um, uh, so while it may not necessarily be from a different viral strain, it may also be uh, the host factors. Um, you know, so so patient with comorbidities or uh, uh, versus a patient who is uh, young and healthy. So a host factor is also very important. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the role for uh, what's the role played by um, different substrains. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, another question, Dr. Ben, comes from Anwar. Uh, he is asking Dr. Ben about the COVID-19 infection status. Is there a window phase for the COVID-19 infection? I mean, when is the time to be uh, the most uh, at risk for transmitting COVID-19 of a patient? Is there a specific cycle threshold limit to determine if someone is still infectious and someone is not yet infectious, Dr. Ben? So I think uh, that one uh, will depend on again, the cycle threshold. So uh, most times patients will be most infectious during approximately the first week of uh, the infection where the uh, viral load is still high. In terms of what is the uh, specific cycle threshold, uh, if I remember correctly, um, the other hospitals in, let's say, NCID have been able to show that uh, if your cycle threshold is above 30, I think 30 or 30 odd, uh, uh, it will be, uh, there is no uh, culturable virus. And with that, then we assume that uh, it is unlikely to be infectious. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. I think we still have one last question, Dr. Ben. Hopefully, this is going to be the last question. Uh, this last question is about the CT value of PCR. Uh, in several weeks, uh, in several past weeks, we have already got some information about CT value on PCR. It is said that patient with CT value over 40 is uh, having a very low risk of transmitting infection to others. Uh, is it applicable? Uh, in these settings of COVID-19 infection. And, and in Singapore, do you use the CT value to treat people, Dr. Ben? Uh, yes, uh, we do use uh, the CT value to try to interpret, uh, number one, when was this, uh, how, where is the timeline of the illness? Meaning that if the CT value is low, then we know that the patient was recently infected. Uh, we also use the CT value to judge how infectious the, the patient is. Um, uh, I would say that for patients whose CT value is uh, 40 and above, that is actually a very, very low viral load. And I will agree that uh, this patient is likely to be not non-infectious. Um, again, the CT value also depends on the sensitivity of the test. Uh, so different, uh, different PCR platforms, uh, um, uh, the CT value uh, may take different significance actually. Yeah, but certainly for a CT value of 40, which is very, very low, uh, uh, this patient is likely to be non-infectious. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. I think we have already 
uh, and sort all the questions from the participants. Uh, thank you very much from all, for all the participants who has already attended the Zoom meeting and have already asked some questions. There are about 400 and, and 60 participants in our Zoom meeting today. It's very, I'm very happy that uh, so many enthusiasm from the medical student, the staff of the medical faculty of the University of Sumatra Utara in this, this Zoom meeting. And I hope that your information and your uh, presentation will be very uh, valuable for us uh, to add our knowledge and to fight and uh, against COVID-19 infection, Dr. Ben. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. Okay. Before we, uh, before ending our Zoom meeting today, I would like to invite the representative from Sing Health, Mr. Wayan, uh, to give some closing statement from this Zoom meeting today. So, Mr. Wayan, uh, Mr. Wayan, still here? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Wayan, please. Time is yours. Uh, okay. Um, hanya. Uh, selamat siang teman-teman semuanya uh, Sangat senang sekali melihat uh, The antusias dari teman-teman semuanya Pertanyaannya banyak dan bagus-bagus semuanya uh, Saya hanya ingin mengir, mengingat, mengingatkan uh, suatu hal ya uh, Banyak dari pengalaman saya setiap kali Dokter-dokter uh, dari luar negeri uh, Memberikan uh, uh, semacam uh, sharing Uh, ada orang-orang yang berkata bahwa wah uh, situasi kita sangat berbeda, jadi tidak aplikabel di uh, apa yang diajarkan tidak aplikabel. Uh, saya tidak sepenuhnya setuju dengan itu uh, karena sering sekali uh, uh, apa yang kita lihat seharusnya uh, adalah konsep-konsepnya dan prinsip-prinsip apa yang diajarkan. Situasinya sangat berbeda, uh, tapi uh, prinsipnya akan sama. Oke. Okay? Uh, pada contohnya uh, tadi uh, dokter uh, Ben dengan suara saya oke okay, uh, mengatakan pentingnya uh, mempunyai definisi yang tepat untuk uh, covid kasus-kasus uh, covid jadi ini sangat penting sekali tapi bagaimana caranya itu mesti disesuaikan dengan uh, lokal oke okay, uh, dengan uh, uh, situasi lokal juga uh, misalnya uh, reorganization dari dari bangsa dari sarana-sarana kesehatan itu penting dilaksanakan uh, tapi uh, cara kita di SGH mungkin berbeda dengan apa yang di, bisa dilakukan di Indonesia uh, tapi prinsipnya akan sama uh, karena reorganisasi itu sangat penting uh, untuk membantu kita memanage kasus-kasus yang datang ke rumah sakit oke okay? um, hanya mau mengingatkan itu selain itu saya tadi uh, minta izin untuk promosi uh, Minggu depan kita akan ada uh, webinar lagi uh, mengenai liver transplant. Uh, ada topik-topiknya yang uh, spesifik uh, berhubungan dengan COVID juga. Uh, saya uh, sangat welcome kalau misalnya teman-teman mahasiswa uh, mau uh, ikut uh, uh, mengikuti. Nah, saya share screen-nya ya. Bisa kelihatan? Ya, sudah sudah terlihat Pak Wayan. Oke, okay. ini bisa dicatat informasinya, uh, uh, daftarnya kemana. Uh, jadi minggu depan tuh uh, mengenai liver, uh, minggu depannya lagi mengenai uh, transplant dari uh, stem cell. Oke, okay. uh, kita juga punya pembiara dari luar negeri juga, jadi kita bisa membandingkan uh, bagaimana caranya uh, transplant di negara-negara yang berbeda. Uh, mungkin ini uh, untuk teman-teman yang baru uh, semester 1, semester 2, agak high level ya, tapi saya rasa sangat berguna sekali untuk setidak-tidaknya uh, bisa menambah ilmu ya. Um, bisa dicatat, uh, itu uh, kalau mau daftar, tinggal daftar sendiri. Oke, okay, ini semuanya gratis, tidak usah bayar. Oke? Okay? Baik, Dr. Pak Wayan. Terima kasih banyak, Pak Wayan, atas informasinya. Oke, okay, ya, terima kasih. Uh, itu saja. Ya, baik. 
Terima kasih Pak Wayan, Pak Wayan atas informasinya. Uh, tentu saja kita akan uh, sebarkan juga informasi mengenai webinar tadi, Zoom meeting tadi yang akan membahas tentang liver transplant dan stem cell transplant. Mudah-mudahan akan bermanfaat juga bagi seluruh sivitas akademika di Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara. Baik, uh, para hadirin yang saya hormati, uh, kita sudah sampai di sesi akhir acara dari webinar Zoom meeting kita pada hari ini. Terima kasih sebesar-besarnya kepada, saya ucapkan kepada seluruh partisipan yang telah hadir mengikuti Zoom webinar, ini, webinar ini dari awal sampai akhir. Terima kasih juga saya ucapkan kepada seluruh mahasiswa, kepada seluruh staf pengajar di Fakultas Kedokteran USU, kepada uh, pimpinan pihak dekanat dari Fakultas Kedokteran USU yang telah banyak memfasilitasi terlaksananya uh, kuliah tamu kita pada hari ini. Uh, Last but not least, I would like uh, to thank very much to Dr. Benjamin, who has already explained very completely about this COVID-19 infection and has already <laughs> updated our information about COVID-19 infection. Hopefully that your uh, your presentation can be uh, can add some more information for us and can be applied in our daily, daily basis. Thank you, Dr. Ben. So, dengan demikian, berakhirlah sesi webinar kali ini atas nama Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sumatera Utara. Saya menyampaikan mohon maaf jika di sana sini masih terdapat kekurangan. Saya tutup sesi webinar Zoom Meeting kita pada hari ini. Insya Allah kita akan bertemu pada webinar Zoom Meeting yang akan datang dengan topik-topik yang selanjutnya akan diinformasikan. Demikianlah webinar kali ini. Saya tutup. Wabilahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much everyone. See you next time. Selamat siang. Terima kasih Udah ya? Masuk lagi? Masuk lagi? Masuk lagi? Masuk lagi? Masuk lagi? Masuk lagi? Masuk Bang Arbi? Bang Arbi? <laughs> Ada yang kurang lagi Bang? Bang?